everybody. Welcome back to the Beyond the Peloton podcast. I'm Spencer Martin from the Beyond the Peloton newsletter. I'm here, as always, with Andrew Vance from the Choose the Hard Way podcast. We were planning our episode for this week when uh, when some sad news hit about the demise of GCN Plus, the, I would say, the best way to view bike races ever in the history of, of streaming content, for sure. Um, so we're going to get into how this happened, what this means, and like most importantly, where can you watch races in 2024? It's not clear at the moment, but before we get into it, Andrew, do you want to say a quick word about your podcast? Yeah, come check out my podcast. It's called Choose the Hard Way, and it's about how hard things build stronger humans who have more fun. And uh, if you enjoy this podcast, I think you'll enjoy that podcast. I've got Kimo Seymour from Lifetime, the president of Lifetime Events, the Lifetime Grand Prix, is uh, with me on an upcoming episode. All the questions that you probably have ever wanted to ask about like what's going on with that series, what's its future, what are they doing over there, where is it headed? And I've also got Alexis Scarta, who's XC Marathon national champ and also big time on that gravel circuit and a rising electronic music superstar. So come check us out. Choose the hard way. Find us everywhere you listen and at Hardway Pod on Instagram. Thank you. Well, we were all living our lives, just, you know, getting to the end of the year, excited for 2024 cycling season. And I assume if you listen to this podcast, you probably are a GCN Plus subscriber and you received an email out of the out of the blue that said geez dear gcm plus subscriber we're sending you this email as a valued subscriber of gcm plus we are very sorry to have to inform you that the service and the app will close on december 19th 2023 that is a month away um i i was shocked to hear this just to give people a bit of background on this G global cycling network gcn was a youtube channel that was launched in january 2013 and I, I don't know how many people remember this. Andrew, you, you're the one who like tipped me off to this. Google used to do a thing where they would fund channels because they had so little original content on YouTube. They wanted people to create content just for YouTube. So they had so it was called a YouTube original channel initiative. And they would basically give you seed capital to start a YouTube channel. That's what GCN did. It was very popular. Like it was known for, you know, how to how to lube your chain or like which bike is faster this. $10,000 super bike or a $1,500 budget bike. Um, just, just like good content over, like they did it over and over again, got a lot of views. They branched out into like race highlights, I, I believe if I have the timeline here, and then they would do a show, like a weekly show where they would break down what's going on in racing. And then eventually they got into streaming races and they got an app, which is very expensive to maintain, which is probably the reason they got shuttered. And they were purchased eventually by Discovery Communications, who owned Eurosport, which is, if you're not familiar, like if you're in Europe and you want to watch a bike race, you can just, or, or any kind of obscure sporting event, you just throw on the TV. Eurosport is a channel you pay for. You do not get it free from the government, but you throw it on, you can watch pretty much any bike race, um, but they have ads. You know, It's just like a normal TV channel. So when Discovery bought Eurosport, they kind of merged GCN and Eurosport together. GCN was the app. Um, and at the time, Eurosport had its own app, app called Eurosport Player. That got eventually phased out. So if you wanted to watch Eurosport online, you, at least in the US, you had to have GCN Plus, but it was much nicer because there was no ads, was just like ad-free viewing of races, any race you wanted to watch, any language you wanted to watch it in. Not that expensive. You know, <laughs> we're kind of maybe getting to why this was shuttered. Um, and Discovery, so Discovery owned Eurosport, GCN. Really. Eurosport is the one you watch on TV. GCN is the one you watch on your computer or phone, and you can cast it to a TV if you so please. But then where this gets complicated is Discovery was bought by Warner Brothers, I believe in 20, 2022. I don't know. Sometime post-COVID, it, it all kind of runs together for me since 2020. But they took on a lot of debt to do this, like $56 billion in debt, I think, which is getting more and more expensive to service as interest rates go up. And David Zaslov, the CEO of the new Warner Brothers Discovery Company, has this guy, I forget his name, but he's like, no, he's a CFO. And like he'll just like go around the company and just slash budgets. That's all he does. And I'm sure he's been thinking, like, why do we have all these 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. They call it like getting gunnered or something if he ever comes into your office because you're just your budget's getting slashed. But so to bring this home, so they have all these different um over the top streaming services. They have like Discovery Plus, which I guess is mainly in Europe. I've never met a person in the US that has Discovery Plus. It's like stuff you would never want to watch. Like I don't even want to, I don't even want to say the name of the things they have, but it, they have a, it's a manner where older women live who might be desirable. And they also have HBO. They had HBO max. They turned that into max. It's kind of like their super app. And I'm sure they were saying, you know, we're losing, I heard they were losing something like $10 million a year just on maintaining the app because it's that expensive to do. And they were saying like, we just got to get rid of this. Why do we have all these races that we're playing on their own app? Let's put it on Discovery Plus because if you're in Europe, you got an email that said all the stuff's going to Discovery Plus. Sign up there if you so please. If you live in the U.S., no news. We we cannot tell you where you are going to watch bike racing in a month and a half. So that was slightly concerning. We'll get into where that might be, but I thought no problem. I'll just run over to Europe via VPN. Sign up for. Discovery Plus, I can watch races. No problem. I'm not going to lose anything. I sell some Bitcoin to populate my PayPal account. I have the VPN on. I sign up. Everything's going great. I try to pay for it. They can tell, uh, it's, I guess it's like a PayPal account originating in the US. So I get blocked there. So I, I cannot do it. This is your biggest fear, Andrew. You've been warning us for years that eventually they will shut you out of their European based streaming services and we're probably going to have to pay like $300 a month to watch bike racing in the U S if we want to watch it at all. Yeah. I think that that's absolutely what's going to happen. And Spencer, I think I shared this with you. I had my parents out here in hope, Maine recently visiting me. Shout out to Bonnie and Gary. Great visit. Thanks for coming. And you know, my dad wanted to watch the chiefs game. He has a spec. He pays for Spectrum Cable back home, which gives him access to the Chiefs game through the Spectrum app if he's in his region. If he's not in his region, he doesn't get it on, you know, and then we explored all the different options through the different streaming services. And is anyone who's a hardcore NFL fan, which I am not, but if you are, you probably know that if you're outside your region, it is absolutely impossible to stream the game without paying for the NFL season ticket, which is $500. And once you hit buy, like you have bought it, maybe they do it in three installments, but there's no, you know, pay for the month type of deal available for that. And if you try to run a VPN to make, for example, your Spectrum cable app, think that you're in a different region. And this is not something that I did, Spencer, but this is something that one might do. I, what ends up happening is it knows you're running a VPN and then it forces you to use the precise location on your phone in order to unlock the content. So they've figured it out. They've stopped you from actually using a VPN or anything else to get content unless you are in the region where the content is geo-restricted. And I just have this feeling it only makes sense that that's what they're going to do with this content. And in addition to that, as we know, the, because the parent company here owns Eurosport and they have rights for these races that we've been watching in Europe, I have to imagine that it's the case that they were paying a probably onerous fee to get the right to broadcast the same races they were broadcasting in Europe under the Eurosport license in the United States, which would be an additional deal. And maybe they got some kind of package discount since they already owned the European streaming rights. And I would have to think that as much as you and I and the people listening to this podcast might have this fantasy that watching professional bike racing is this incredibly popular thing now exploding in popularity due to the um, Netflix series on chain. The reality is that the total addressable market for this product right now is probably not gigantic. And the money that they're bringing in is probably far less than the money they're putting out for rights and then for the production of the live coverage to a company like the commentary, the stuff you've seen in the studio with Orla, Dan, Daniel Lloyd, McEwen. And then there's the whole original content library that they created, which 
I have to guess that that was to probably heighten the perception of the value of their product, um, drive daily active users and get a bigger multiple when they tried to sell the company, but that didn't, you know, or, or whatever the company had already been acquired. I think they were trying to, trying to substantiate the value of the product and the engagement. So I think where we net out here is they weren't bringing in enough money. <laughs> it's costing yeah. Warner brothers a ton of money. And for the sake of efficiency, there's like, Oh, you know, the operating cost here is onerous. Like let's slash this and who cares? There'll be some subset of people who can no longer access the content. I think the big existential question here is, is this content going to be available through some, uh, discovery or Warner's streaming service? And if not, does that mean that flow steps in and purchases the rights to these events? And that would be better than nothing, but based on my experience viewing things on flow, not much better than nothing. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. I I've it, it gets even weirder because Discovery Warner Brothers Discovery owns like twenty percent of Flow. So why they owned GCN and a percentage of Flow makes no sense to me whatsoever. So we'll just set that aside for one second. You mentioned the original content on GCN Plus. I spoke to a CEO of. Uh, let's just say like a digital media company who has a paywalled service. He said they made a lot of original series like GCN did, thinking that it would drive sign up. So maybe the thinking yeah. was, okay. you know, some people like bike racing. A lot of people like bikes who don't like bike racing. Let's make documentaries for them. They'll sign up, right? No, it's actually not true. The only way to get people to sign up for a service is live sports. That's why live sports rights are insanely high. You know, it's really like, uh, Fox News, uh, people yelling at you, live sports, and maybe a few like three or four ultra popular shows can get anyone to sign up for a pay service. So what they realized was, well, once people have it, they'll watch these documentaries, but they're not going to drive sign up. So maybe that was in the same era where it's like, let's create this uh, content library. So if you don't like bike racing, maybe you'll sign up for the service. Didn't work, clearly. They just didn't get enough people. Their price point was pretty low. It's like a third of Flow Sports. Um, so I was always a little curious how they were going to make that work. But if we just think about this, you know, Discovery, Warner Brothers Discovery, so whatever you want to call this parent company, owns this content now. The, the way, the mode in which you viewed it is now gone because it was too expensive to maintain. The question is, where does it go? They've said in Europe that, you know, really you can go uninterrupted to... I think in some countries they do have Discovery Plus, so it will just be on Discovery Plus. It's, it's like an app they already own, easy for them to migrate that content. I think like Belgium, there's a few countries that don't have Discovery Plus, and I think they have a service called Eurosport Extra, and so you have to go sign up for that. You can watch it on that, I believe. All the race is uninterrupted. But then there's many regions like the USA, where we live, Andrew, where they've just said, yeah, we don't, we don't really know what we're going to do with this content. Stay tuned. So here's a few, a, a few uh, options for what they could do. I guess they could put it on, you know, I've never met a person in the US that describes a Discovery Plus because we have Max, the very confusingly named service formerly known as HBO. Um, why they called it Max, I have absolutely no idea. But it's like very expensive. It's $20 a month to subscribe to. It's crazy. But I guess they could put it on Max. Like they already have their TNT ass sports assets on there. You know, my my concern number one is they put it on Discovery Plus because Max, you get access to some Discovery Plus content, but not all. You'll get like two, you know, two episodes of MILF Manor. But if you want to watch the rest of MILF Manor, you've got to go sign up for Discovery Plus. It's basically a way just to harvest more and more and more money from you. Um for the same content on different services. And my concern is, concern number one, they put it on Discovery Plus. If they put it on Max, it's like, that's expensive, but probably a lot of us have Max because we wanted to watch the session. There's other things on there that we wanna see. So they put it on Max, like me personally, no problem. I already pay for Max. I've got it. I've saved some money on GCN Plus. I'm actually in the black here. They put it on Discovery Plus. If you want to watch bike racing, you're going to have to go up and sign up for a second Warner Brothers Discovery streaming service, like a more niche one. 
in addition to your Mac subscription. The third one that you brought up, Andrew, is they try to sell it. You know, why would they do that? I was thinking like, why would they do this? You already own these assets. You've paid for them, presumably. So you could just air them on one of your streaming services for the cost of like the hosting, the server space, basically, to make right. it play on an app. That's not nothing, though. That's not negligible. So they might realize, you know, so few people are going to sign up. So few additional people will sign up for these services in the U.S., because bike racing is on there, that it's actually not worth us to pay to put it on the server to play in the US. And that's where it gets into dangerous territory, in my opinion, because I think that's right. I think so few people would say, oh, all the GCN stuff is on Max. I'll, I don't have that and I'll sign up for it. Or Discovery Plus, I don't have that. I'll sign up for it. So few people would do that. They probably wouldn't cover the cost of them making it play on your device in the US. So here's what they could do. They could, as you said, they could try to sell it off. Like this is basically, we're upside down on this asset. It costs us more to play it than it does bring in revenue in the US market. So let's sell our US market viewing rights to Flow. That makes sense. Well, Flow is gonna say, and it gets weird because I guess Flow is owned partially by the same people trying to sell it to them. I don't quite know how that would work, but Flow is gonna say, Okay, you have this, you need money. You have $56 billion in debt that is getting more and more expensive to service. And something that happened since the two companies merged or they bought Discovery, Warner Brothers Discovery stock is decreased by half. So we're, that, that gets tricky because a lot of times those loans are taken out against this company's stock. If the stock goes down too much, they get margin calls from the bank. They have to then go give them a bunch of money because the collateral for the loan is decreasing in value. So that, that could be happening here. And they just need as much money as possible. Like, we got to get rid of these freaking races. We can't have them. Just give us some cash. But Flo's going to say, who else is going to buy them? Who are we competing against? Peacock, maybe. So they might not get very much for them. And here's the big concern. Number Option number four, they don't do anything with them because it costs too much to actually make them play in the US that so they just think like, eh, these are dead ducks anyway. No one's going to give us any money for it. Let's just not, let's just not play the Giro d'Italia in the U.S. It's not worth it. And that's where we were, you know, like seven, eight years ago. Like I thought Italy was a really dark country for most of my life because I was watching on pirate feeds, feeds that were so low quality of the Giro d'Italia that I was like, man, this is always like cloud cover. Like it's a, it's a real poor resolution country. No, I went to Italy. It's beautiful. But, you know, that's how we're going to have to watch uh, my fear is that's how we're going to have to watch these races because they just realize eh, it's not even worth it to sell them or air them. So let's just let them rot in a in a digital basement somewhere and we'll take, st take the tax write off. Well, a hot take here is that this opens the door for Lifetime, which is working to expand its coverage of its gravel events in the United States, I guess gravel and mountain bike. That's one of the things Chemo talked about in our interview for choose the hard way uh if you saw the final race of the lifetime series you know, they now they're trying a helicopter which of course has been happening for perpetuity in road cycling but they're doing some pretty interesting things to try to create better coverage of those events and i mean if we have this this gap in available cycling coverage i think that we could see increased demand in that category and it could become far more popular i think as it relates I, I just have so many questions about the specifics of of what's happened here and as i'm searching around i'm not getting a ton of answers because play sports network and they are based in bath and when i was an executive at strava we had an office in bristol which is about an hour from bath so there are all those uh on air hosts, most of them were based in Bath, at least. Why that does that time. happen, Andrew? What I, I've always wondered I why, <laughs> like every magazine that you would always apply to work for is based in Bath or Bristol. I'm like, what's going I on mean, in that part of the yeah, country? Yeah, Bristol's a pretty cool town. I mean, uh, at least from an arts and entertainment perspective, Massive Attack, Banksy, Port has had a lot of uh, pretty amazing things coming out of out of Bristol and the riding is, is not bad and get out to the Cheddar Gorge with a short ride from Bristol proper. Um, 
But yeah, I'm wondering like what happens to the rest of the assets within Play Sports Group. I'm not seeing anything in the coverage so far, but I have to assume it's going to, they're going to be, this has to impact the whole group, but it wasn't like just- Like not GCN assets or- Well, I mean, you had GCN and then I I don't know how the the company is structured, but you had Global Mountain Bike, Bike Network, Global Triathlon Network. I believe that Play Sports Group also produces the Garrett Thomas- podcasts unless that's part of play sports network not play sports group but if i'm recalling correctly i think it's part of play sports group so we could just have uh i mean gosh, i i believe the, the vacuum that's about to be created i believe everything that's not the app that's not gcm plus just continues as normal you know like like yeah. the the youtube channel is just going to continue you know the yeah. the show they do on youtube Everything that's basically the app was just so expensive to maintain. They're like, we got to get rid of this thing because we're bleeding. We're bleeding out here. So I believe Play Sports Group, which is a subsidiary of Discovery, which is a subsidiary of Warner Brothers Discovery, will just continue to operate as normal just without the app and GCN mm -hmm. Plus service. So all the like the GCN website, which is fantastic for cycling news, will just continue to run. And that probably explains why they started to beef that up over the summer. Like they hired Daniel Benson. It's like, that's kind of funny because they don't normally do written content. And now we can see why, because the plan must have been in place to, to go away from the GCN Plus app and more towards just a website and YouTube channel and try to make some money there. Okay. Well, if they do have, if they do have a stake in flow, maybe this all shifts over to flow. Although I don't understand how that would make any sense. Cause even in the scenario you're describing, you're, they're still, I'm sure, operating at a loss. So I just don't understand why they but would want to. But it's less of a loss, right? I guess, but I mean, because... the the whole point here is like you get rid of things that don't drive revenue. So or, if they don't, or like, but the thing that I think that was, I think the albatross here was GCM plus because it was so expensive to to do. So it's like they still own all the races. Like they've paid for those. They've got to put them somewhere. So if flow. And it, it gets weird because I, I heard from someone that they were paying quite a bit of money to license the the rights from Eurosport, even though it's the same. It's basically an inter com company, intra yeah. company transfer. Right. So I don't know if Flo then has to pay their partial owner probably a bunch of money to air those races, but those have been like paid for. So if they don't air the races, they just eat the loss on whatever they paid RCS for the rights to the Giro d'Italia in the US market. I don't know. I'm just having these flashbacks to the days before GCM plus. I'm thinking about it was not good. Yeah. What like what did I used to have to do to watch Cyclocross World Cups when I was deep in the mud? Deep in the mud. Uh <laughs> when you and, were a, a mud puppy. <laughs> all you needed yeah, was I, yeah. I remember like create it's fine. I blocked this all out. Like going to a friend's basement and he had like some service rigged up and it was basically like you could watch any bike race happening anywhere in the world but it was completely illegal basically like an illegal server he was running but man we might have to go back to that it's gonna be yeah. disappointing it's like an atari 2600 hooked up to a, a 16 foot in diameter satellite dish in the backyard you know that might have to go to <laughs> cheyenne mountain to get some of these live streams but no i mean i remember that yeah, like you would have to wait for someone to upload something illegally to YouTube, basically. <laughs> somebody <Yeah. laughs> somebody would live recorded a race and you get a foreign language broadcast on YouTube maybe before it got pulled down. Or you'd have to go to Tiz Cycling, which is a, a pirate streaming should site. We even... No one no one should ever go. Please never use it. It's you don't want to go there. Um, but yeah, that's like what are people gonna do to get coverage of these events and if you think about um you know i was i was hoping that we might be able to access jonathan Botters actually to talk about this because if we think about our last episode and kind of the groundwork that that uh cartel of pro team owners or pro teams were trying to form this alleged giant deal that was potentially going to happen that was going to bring 600 million dollars of financing into the sport and to really dial in 
most importantly, streaming rights and participation in deal points. Well, gosh, this seems like quite a setback to that plan. If you And we had Richard Pluga on here, what, six weeks ago, talking about how important the North American market is. Yeah. Well, if, you, yeah. If, if you can't, <laughs> you can't, if nothing's being streamed in North America, I think you've effectively lost the market. So forget about the tour of the Gila or Joe Martin classic. Yeah. It is. It's funny that this has all happened uh, since Pluga was on here, but it, it is frustrating because it's this big debate on like Pluga and Vodders want to, want to turn cycling into a commercial monster, just like all the other sports. Isn't this bad? That's kind of the been, the reaction to this one cycling venture they want to do. But it's like, this is why they're doing it. Cause this is not sustainable. You can't just have like the Giro d'Italia, the third biggest race in on the calendar, just like that. Nah, it's not, not on TV in the U S market, which I'd say U S has done pretty well for itself. Pretty big country. You could say pretty wealthy. If you're a, if you're a sporting event, you probably want to be televised here. And so it's like, if this isn't on TV in the US, this is a massive step back. And it makes it almost feel like people are like out in front of a house squabbling about an addition and then the house is burning down. Yeah. It's like, maybe we need to try to get the races on TV in the US. That would, that would be good. But yeah. And why is this happening now? I guess would be the next question. Probably it's just as it's just rising interest rates, I would assume. You know, they have to try to refinance some of these loans, restructure them. And, it's costing them a ton more money than they thought it would because interest rates have gone up since they decided to take on 50 plus billion dollars of debt to, to buy maybe, discovery maybe. or yeah. Warner, whatever they bought. But not, it's not good. It's it, the, or I guess I should say like, it is, it's sad. It's, it's very sad that GCM plus is going away because it was good. Um, if you just watch the tour, it doesn't really affect you because all ASO races, which now, looks like a genius move are not on GCN in the U S they're on Peacock or NBC USA, whatever's going on over there in the NBC sports world. So those are unaffected here, at least in the U S market, the RCS who sold the Giro rights to GCN plus for the U S market now looks a little less savvy because oops, you might not be on in that market. So I guess it's it's a bummer because that was a really good product. In retrospect, probably didn't cost enough. It was probably a little too overproduced. Like if you watch a lot of these flow race, these races on flow sports, flow cycling, whatever they call it, you know, there's like maybe an announcer, maybe, you know, <laughs> or there's definitely no po- pre-race show, post-race show. If you think about GCM Plus, they were spending a lot of money to produce that, weren't charging that much for it, probably didn't have a ton of volume. So that likely doom the service right there but now who knows maybe maybe the best case scenario was is that flow takes it all on you all have to sign up for flow sorry it's like expensive and impossible to cancel i thought i've canceled it like three times and then the world championships roll around and it's like worlds is on flow oh no i don't have it it's like actually surprise i do i'm never getting rid of it so yeah that would be okay i mean i guess the best would be if they just rolled it into the max streaming service and we could all watch it on the ultra expensive max we have as we wait for secession to come back or night. No, it's done. Oh my God. I'm just now realizing secession's not coming back live on air. So, um, that's devastating to me, but I, I, I don't know if there's anything else to say about this. It's sad. It was probably unsustainable and we're waiting to see where we can watch bike racing in the future. Yeah. And who knows? I mean, if we think about how worked up everyone got about, the Enios, which I'm trying to think about. There were so many rumor mergers. Like first we had Enios Quick Step, yeah. Then we had Yumbo Quick Step. Then we had a cartel was being formed. Don't and forget about Amazon buying or yeah, sponsoring Yumbo. Amazon was sponsoring Yumbo. Like a lot has happened in the past couple of months. And then I think around the time we did the last podcast, it was the Lefebvre Remco isn't right. <laughs> He just needs a few more years to get ready to ride the (laughs) tour. I mean, there's just so much, so much disinformation floating around. Who knows what's actually happening? And we're going to find out. Well, well, you've transitioned us perfectly. Our two little grab bag topics before we have to let you go back to work, Andrew. 
there was rumors like a week ago. Wow, Van Art skipping the Tour de France, doing the Giro. I guess as a uh, the story made it sound like he was a GC contender at the Giro d'Italia a week oh, yeah. after Paris Roubaix. Yeah. Or no, sorry, a month after Paris Roubaix wraps up. This is all preparation for the Olympics. You know, I did a uh, edition or a post on this on my newsletter. Really, if you want to win the Olympics, you have to do the tour. I mean, that I couldn't find anyone in recent history that had won the Olympic road race or time trial without at least doing a week of the Tour de France. So the why he would skip the tour to prepare for the Olympics makes absolutely no sense. Him competing as a GC contender at this year would certainly be fun for us. I don't know how fun that would be for him. He'd have to lose a ton of weight after Pair Roubaix. And I guess him winning stages would be kind of fun, but this is, let's just say this is true. He, he was a little tipsy in Colombia. I don't know if you noticed this, like Rigobert Tehran, like threw a party, like a group ride basically in Colombia and seemed like just a big flex. Like I can make all the, I can make Wout Van Aert fly across the world to come to my party and go on a ride with me. But he said there that he's doing the Giro, that that's his goal for the season. I know it's still unclear to me if he's skipping the tour. I would be surprised because he is so important to Jonas and his ability to win these Tour de France's. But this kind of, and with the departure of Primoz Roglic, Sepku saying that he's a GC guy now, it's kind of all your, your premonition that basically Yumbo was going to fall apart, that this was unsustainable. The amount of talent they had in support roles could not last. Like if Wout skips the tour, Sep is, is a co leader. And Primoz isn't there. It's not clear exactly who, like, who's with Jonas and these tough mountain stages that have like three or four climbs. It starts to look like a much weaker team. Is this like a band that's gotten really big and then now it's like everyone wants to do solo projects and they're all going their own way? Yeah, I mean, they're not Creed, who I believe is reuniting to bring us all of their hits uh, on a tour that's coming soon. They're not at that point yet. They haven't had the breakup, but it does seem like the band might be falling apart. And, you know, in addition to that, because I think we were talking about this before we started recording, but the, the story that came out this week with reporting about Garrett Thomas's off-season activities, and he's on the record saying, I was drunk 12 of the last 14 <laughs> nights. This new generation just takes things way too seriously. And what I like to do in the off-season is, is like go down to the pub, hang out with my friends, get quite drunk. And then as a consequence of that, because I'm quite hung over the next day, I'm just eating a lot and I've now put on 15 pounds. And is this a quote or is this like yeah, no, you, no, no, <laughs> this isn't fan fiction. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that's pretty much what he said in the story. I'm bringing that up because I'm just thinking about what Garrett has shared about what he had to do to be a Tour de France contender and the level of sacrifice that it takes to be a GC rider, it's just like a step above everything else that you have to do in the sport of cycling. And I just think that that's going to be, I, I know that I've been banging this drum for the past year and a half, two years now, but it's like a, it's an entirely different level of commitment if you want to win a grand tour. And if you want to win the tour de France, it's an even higher level of commitment and it's just really, really hard on these riders as humans. It's hard on their relationships. And it's not a very sustainable path over time. And I mean, Garrett Thomas has talked about that a lot as well, because, you know, when he was actually a serious Tour de France contender or riding for Froome and Wiggins, Team Sky at that time had these guys going out and doing like five to seven hour rides in a fasted state which they've all described as just being hellish and the thinking at that time that this was when all of the ketone stuff started to get popular was go out in a fasted state. You can improve your level of fat metabolism. And then when you go back on to high carbohydrate, you're this, you know, like you're turbocharged because you're more efficient at burning fat. You're in an aerobic state longer. And then when you throw carbs on top of that, you're unstoppable. Turns out that, yeah, that it is good to be fat adapted and that's not a smart way to train. You want to train as we know with as much carbohydrate as possible and pretty much nobody trains like that anymore. No yeah, what it's you've read. really interesting because, and I, I think this is part of even Froome claims that his bike fit was wrong and that's why he's slow, but 
yeah, it used to be the starvation training strategy and everything you're saying, I guess, kind of checks out from a science perspective, but then it all got usurped by, no, you carb up, get as carved up as possible. And like, basically the training is so hard. Like you're, you're able to train at an intensity that is ripping your body to shreds, but that's what makes you able to race as hard as these guys are racing. That yeah. it was a mistake essentially to train like that. Thomas is a Thomas is an interesting character. <laughs> I, I would say maybe going to the pub 12, 12 out of 14 nights is also tough on your family life. I can't imagine just uh, hey hun, good luck putting the kids to bed. Uh, me and the me and the lads are gonna be down getting wasted at the pub. That might be some trouble at home. But he's kind of a throwback in that he cuts loose. And it might sound crazy to think like, is drinking in October really that bad for your performance next July? Doesn't how could that possibly matter? I'm hearing from writers that like these new, like the new generation, like Jonas and Tade, they're never drinking. They're never having any fun. Like they never do anything that's outside of their training bubble, basically ever. Like there's no off season. And I think that's unsustainable. I'm like, there's no way that you could have a long career doing that. But someone even brought up the possibility to me, like maybe they don't maybe older people like you, me and Garrett Thomas associate, you know, our life is a pattern of like, work hard, go black out. Like you and I were blacked out after every episode of this right down at the pub. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, maybe like, that's just the way we've been trained to view the world. And that a younger generation is just like, what if you just work hard all the time and you never have any fun and these guys will never burn out. That's probably not true, but someone did bring up that possibility with me that it's not even like Tade is on a program all the time. He doesn't even view it as a program. He just views that as life and he never cuts loose ever because yeah. he doesn't even view the training to be that much of putting him out. He's, but I, I, I don't know if I buy it, but that, that was an interesting thought. Look at what happened to Ivan Drago. <laughs> exactly you know yeah but no i mean on a more serious note i think that there are actually three factors at play here one i genuinely think yeah i do think that that's garen thomas's approach and i think that in the pattern of his career it served him well because he's talked about that since he's had a podcast he's always talked about this and that's one of the things he enjoys doing and when he's somewhere with his teammates after a race or training he enjoys going out and getting a drink and he's commented on how the younger generation like they won't even have one beer and hey that's fine if that's that's uh your relationship with alcohol he seems to have a different one the second thing i would say is let's not forget what happened last season between garrett thomas and enios which is he did not have a contract and they were in a tug of war for a very long time before he signed with the team. We know that he signed at a reduced rate. So that's the second factor. And I think that there are likely some hard feelings, especially on his side about how that happened. And then I think the third factor is he now has a signed contract. This is likely to be his last season. And I think he's thinking about what happened last year. And this is a bit of an a middle finger to team management because he can do and say pretty much whatever he wants within within reason now and he's not gonna you know they can't 86 his contract i think he has two more years he just signed a two-year deal so well, he, he signed he could, through 2025 yeah. yeah so but i'm saying like he's locked in like he doesn't care. yeah he's, he he's very, not doing, very clearly he's not doing another contract after 2025 yeah, he very clearly does not care about the team's point of view on his behavior and what he's saying publicly. I think that that's very evident. Well, what's interesting is I, and they, maybe this bothers them. Maybe it doesn't it does kind of seem like they don't have the best relationship and they probably don't like him saying this. The crazy thing about Garen Thomas, I believe he's going to be 38 in this coming season. He's getting better. You know, like you might read this stuff and think like, this is going to be tough for him. And I do think maybe not this lifestyle, but just his body type, it's hard for him to do well in more than one grand yeah. tour a year because he has to lose so much weight. Um, I, don't, I, th I don't think that's the drinking and the pub food. I think he's just a bigger person than a lot of these other GC riders. He's, I mean, he's said that on the record too. He's talked about it on his podcast because he did it twice this year because he targeted the, the Giro and the Vuelta. And he was like, yeah, his walking around weight is 15 pounds. And I mean, I'm talking when he's in top shape but not grand tour shape. He's yeah. 15 pounds heavier. And that means 
he's, he's, you know, I'm, I'm betting that even in that condition, he's probably like three to 5% body fat. And then he's cutting probably 15 pounds of muscle would be my guess. And I guess what happened, like he was just not the same rider at the Vuelta. He probably just, you can only do that so many times, right? Without yeah. sacrificing your power. But where, oh, it's Garen Thomas getting better, you know, like third at the tour in 2022, second at the Giro in 2023, you might say, well, third at the tour is actually better than second at the Giro. Very competitive Giro though. Almost won that race. Took Primoz Roglic to stage 20. You almost beat him. The guy... Going into his 38th year on, on earth, 38 years old, probably Ineos' best GC rider still. So, you know, they can be upset as they want, but clearly this is like a working formula for him. Um, I think he's one of the top grand, as long as he does one grand tour for GC, probably one of the top riders below Pogacar, Roglic, and Vindigo going into next year. So, it's working. He, I'm a little concerned he's training in Malibu. Not not the safest place to ride a bike. Um, may, I mean, but at this point, you know, I've like doubted Garrett Thomas so much where I'm like, I, I'm kind of, whatever he thinks he needs to do, I guess you have to trust him. But it is funny to see these quotes and it does feel like a middle finger to the team, as you say. Yeah, and that might be a great place to, to stop today with Garrett Thomas hoisting his middle finger. We're going to wait and see what happens with streaming rights. And gosh, like what's, what's going to happen with Enios as well going, (laughs) that's, that's, maybe that's a topic for another day. That was on my, like we kicked it, but something I do want to talk about next time is Enios is, uh, the team sky mastermind, Dave Brailsford is it's looking like he's going to be installed as CEO president, like sporting president at Manchester United. So he won't be focusing on the cycling team. I, I would have to guess at all, but it's funny because this is viewed as like a major win for the team. But us in the cycling world, it's like Dave Brailsford, good at his job, I guess you could say. The team has not done well recently, but known as like the least socially adept person maybe of all time. You know, it's like everyone who interacts with him is like he has no emotion. He can't build connections with people. And it's like, he's going into an extremely complex world of soccer where everything is about personal connection. Like, I don't know how well this is going to go. Like, I feel like someone who knows a secret and none of these soccer people know what's coming for them, but I'm quite curious to see how that pans out for him at Man U. But Andrew, we will, we've got to get to these canyons in Malibu and uh, we're going to be on Garrett Thomas lookout, maybe the next episode from LA. Yeah. You'll be the wind beneath my wings on those climbs, Spencer. Well, I'll we'll, we'll be I'll be pushing you up as we're we're dodging cars. I, I won't leave you. Yeah, it's a long way from BWR Kansas. <laughs> uh, it's a long way physically, but spiritually, emotionally, you could say Lawrence and Los Angeles share share a lot of values. Basically, the same. Both yeah. have a Chipotle. Yeah, Lawrence. <laughs> Lawrence is the LA on the cause. They say. Well, thank you, and we'll let you. <laughs> <laughs> We'll let you get back to work. (laughs) We'll, We'll be back after Thanksgiving.